Tov. All right, so we're in a new month, Chodesh Tov. It is the month of Iyar. The month of Iyar um, is the second month. Uh, for those of you who tuned in to yesterday's year, uh, according to the Torah, Nisan is the first month of the Jewish uh, the, the Bible's calendar counting, and Iyar is the second month. And Iyar is an acronym for Ani Hashem Rofecha. I am the Lord, your healer. So we all need healing right now, so we should pray Be'ezot Hashem together that um, this month should really be a month of healing for everyone and that, God willing, we should see a vaccine and uh, no more deaths and, by and large, just economic uh, recovery and health, you know, medicinal recovery for everyone um, that needs it. So, God willing, our studying tonight should be for all those that were lost, that they should have an elevation of the soul, and uh, all those that are sick, that they should have a speedy recovery. Rabbi? Yes, question. When was, when was Rosh Chodesh? We started the new month. When was Rosh Chodesh? So, there's a two-day Rosh Chodesh. Um, for you in America, it will be tonight and, and Shabbos. So, Friday night, Thursday night and Friday night. It will conclude by Saturday night, uh, Rosh Chodesh is over. It's a two-day Rosh Chodesh, the 30th of Nisan and the 1st of Iyar. So uh, make sure to include in your davening, whether it's Birkat Mazon, um, the blessing after the meal, or uh, whether it's your uh, regular tefillah, Yadav, Yavo, the, all the things. Um, those of you who are praying on your own, you're going to be saying Musa for Rosh Chodesh, the additional prayer rite, and before that even, you're going to be saying uh, Halel, a half Halel, not the full Halel. So it's really cool. Uh, those of you who want a reason to have a beer, have a L'chaim, it's a great reason for Rosh Chodesh. Okay, so I'm going to start with a story. Um, those of you who already um, are subscribed or whatever to my YouTube channel and stuff, it's already been uploaded, so if you didn't you know, whatever reason, don't catch everything here. You can always catch it back there. And uh, for the you guys at the yeshiva, I'll be sure to post it into the WhatsApp group for us that you guys can check it out there as well. So this story, um, it's about the Chernobyl Rebbe. The Chernobyl Rebbe was a big tzaddik, very holy, holy individual. And um, his name was Rabbi Mordechai of Chernobyl. He had a young man that worked in his home during the winters he would stoke uh, the the fires to keep the the entire house the furnaces so that the heart, entire house would be warm and he was majorly afflicted he had uh, psoriasis all over his body and boils that covered a lot of his body he was a lot of times he would you know be erupting and blood would be spurting he would be in a lot of pain and it was kind of a mystery to the Hasidim, to the, to the students of uh, Rabbi Mordechai of Chernobyl, why he even decided to have this young man work for him. Obviously, it wasn't the pleasant side, but even more uh, confusing for them was that he was known, the Rebbe, uh, as having great compassion, as uh, being very sensitive to the, the pain and suffering of others. And yet, every single time you would see this man crying out in pain, uh, as he was trying to do his work, the Chernobyler, you know, his mouth was shut. He didn't really say anything. And this perplexed them because for the rest of the community and everything, you know, he was, he was always like feeling their pain and, and then some. So it was very strange when one day he came back home and he found this young man in even more pain than he, anyone had ever seen him. He all, you know, those, he had a lot of blood. He was screaming in agony and still trying to go about his work. And eventually it was like the true nobler just couldn't handle it. And he, and he stopped in the middle of the room and he said, Ribbono Shu'alam, creator of the world, enough is enough. And mysteriously that very same day, um, this young man passed away. So the Hasidim knew their Rebbe well enough to know that you know, there's something up here. This is a bit bizarre. And one of them had, you know, a little bit of courage, if you will. He, you know, he felt bold enough that he asked the Rebbe, you know, please, you've got to explain to us, you know, this whole thing, what's going down. And so the Rebbe, Rabbi Mordechai of Chernobyl, said, well, I, in order to understand, I have to tell you a story. So he says, my father, his father's name was Rabbi Menachem 
Nahum of Chernobyl. He preceded his son, Rabbi Mordechai, as the Rebbe. So he says, my father, it was known, even though he was a great righteous individual, he was very poor. He didn't have much money for his family, his needs. And just happened to be the case that there was a very wealthy man in the community that time and time again was there to support the Rebbe's household and was happy to do so, giving a great deal of uh, tzedakah, of money to keep the Rebbe's household afloat. And eventually this man contrived, uh, you know, an idea. He, he realized like, hey, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, the Rebbe, I'm pretty dear to him. Might as well give this a shot. So he said to the Rebbe, I would like to propose a match for, you know, one of your children to marry one of my children. And he was surprised when the Chernobyl Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem Nachum of Chernobyl, said, without hesitation, absolutely not. And he continued to press, please, 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 you know, uh, I don't understand why not. And he wasn't going to get any uh, explanation. He just got a straight no. And it got to the point where he got so aggravated that from being his biggest benefactor, he became some, uh, actually in opposition to the Rebbe. He started trying in any way he can to just, you know, frustrate him and, and, and cause his life a little bit more misery, to have vengeance on him in a sense for not allowing his child to marry the Chernobyl's child. And on one such occasion, he discovered that the Chernobyl Rebbe's daughter, who was married, would be going to mikveh, to immerse in the mikveh that evening. And he hired, this wealthy man hired a bunch of hoodlums, ruffians, to go and torment her. So you could imagine she's walking home after having mikveh you should feel very pure you should it's a special night for a man and a woman to bond and to unite and god willing to draw down a lofty soul and these young men immediately come upon her and start cat calling her and and just really acting in an unsavory manner to the point where she starts trying to find refuge in side alleys and everything like that eventually she makes it home thank god but she collapses on the ground and she's just so scarred from the event, she it took her over a month to really like bounce back and be willing to like kind of like go out again because she was it was such a traumatic experience. And eventually, the Chernobyler found out who was behind this. It was the wealthy man. And when he found out, he got really pissed off, as you would imagine. I mean, understandably so. Now, it was a few months later that this wealthy man actually passed away. And when he passed away his soul went up to the heavens. Remember, this is the story that the Rabbi Mordechai is telling. He says his soul went up to the heavens. And the, there was the heavenly tribunal there. There's a court case. It happens for anyone who passes away. And they right away were, were pretty, you know, they, they came out and they were pretty intense. The, the heavenly court had a lot of animosity towards uh, this wealthy man for the overall treatment of the tzaddik, the way he, he, you know, he made his life such a misery. And they, they were looking to really send him to Geinon, you know, that he should have a very, very terrible punishment. But then one angel spoke up and said, but what about all the good things he did? You know, he, uh, he studied some Torah, he has some studying, and that's like, you know, the Talmud Torah, Kenegit Kulam, that study of Torah is like equal to all the mitzvahs, so that's big. Not only that, he, all that financial backing for all those years of the Chernobyl's house, like that's got to count for something. So after much deliberation, it was decided in the heavens that two angels would go and escort this wealthy man's soul back down. And their judgment would be very much contingent based on what the Chernobyler himself would say. So immediately these two angels, so to speak, brought down the soul of this wealthy man. And the wealthy man's soul, you know, presented itself before the Chernobyler Rabbi Menachem Nachum of Chernobyl. And, and he said, you know, I, please i'm like you know we need your help in figuring out what should be done with him so 
the Chernobyl said, fine, tell me what are the sins that you have against me? So he, he listed the first one and right away the Chernobyl said, with all my heart, I utterly forgive you for that sin. And he says, next. And he gave him another one. And he says, with all my heart, I wholeheartedly forgive you for that sin. And then the next one. And finally, the last one, he forgave everyone. But finally, the last one was the one with the daughter. And he says, and then there was, you know, this where I, you know, I did this thing and I hired these hoodlums to, to aggravate and to torment your daughter. And to this, the Chernobyl immediately said, no. He says, this wasn't against me. This was against my offspring. This was against heaven. And for that, I, I cannot forgive you. And so just like that, they had gone through all the sins and went back up to the heavens. And the heavenly court decided that this wealthy man needed to be in, reincarnated and needed to suffer. You know, he had to make rectification for the wrong he had done. And eventually the Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem, Nachum of Chernobyl passed away and he passed on his leadership to his son who was telling the story, Rabbi Mordechai. And Rabbi Mordechai said, right after I took over leadership, I had a dream. And in this dream, my father came to me and he told me to hire this young man that was stricken with all these uh, ailments, the psoriasis and everything like that. And he said to, to me to keep him in your boat until literally you just can't handle it anymore. And when that's the case, just say to the creator, enough is enough. This indeed, the soul of this man was the wealthy man reincarnated. And he was, the reason he was afflicted as he was, was because he needed to make amends for the treatment that he had, you know, unfortunately tormented the Chernobyl Rebbe and he had especially tormented the Rebbe's daughter. So it's timely, why? Because of the Parsha. The Parsha we're in is um, Mitzorah Tazria, which deals with affliction, something like a leprous um, affliction that's already supernatural, as we're going to find out in this week's Parsha. Um, also, maybe Corona, you know, uh, there's nothing without reason. Um, we have to trust that there, there is a creator, that there is true justice, a true justice that is devoid of any kind of possible corruption because the creator, you know, can't be bought or sold or anything like that. His eyes see beyond our incarnation to all incarnations and he knows exactly measure for measure what needs to be meted out to each individual. So we can understand these things and that's where faith comes into the equation. So the portions that we have, we have two parashiyot here in Israel this week, Tazria and Mitzora. And they deal with this kind of leprous thing. Why I said it was supernatural is because it wasn't like a regular ailment. It was an ailment that afflicted um, not just an individual, like their body and their hair and their, you know, their overall complexion, but could even afflict their clothing and even the walls of their homes. So we see that it was very supernatural in this regard. Now, the reason our sages tell us that someone would be afflicted with tsarat, is what it's called, Cyrus, if you don't like to pronounce the last half, is because of slander. And as a result, one would have to bring a, a, an offering of birds. And our sages point out, just be like you caused bad, you know, energy out in the world by using your mouth to chirp, chirp, chirp bad things, so too you're going to bring measure for measure birds to make an amends, right? For, for you chirp, chirping, the, the birds will also always chirping, chirping will we'll fix that. And generally speaking, the, the, the word Cyrus itself is, is, is connected to the idea of like, in a sense, raising up um, linguistically, the word itself. The idea is that you raise yourself above someone else. The only reason you can talk smack on someone else is because you think you're better than them. So there is a level of ego and haughtiness in the equation here that you talk smack on someone else because you think you're better than them or you want to belittle them or whatever. So there is that whole in the end. There's also Okay, so before, kind of sidestepping for a moment, the actual parasha of Tazria begins with when a woman will conceive and give birth. And... 
And the, it's kind of curious that a woman has to bring a sin offering. Right away, she performs the miracle of childbirth, one of the greatest things an individual can do to bring new life into this world. And yet she is immediately rendered impure and she has to bring a sin offering. So Rashi, the biblical commentator, points out, why does she have to bring the sin offering? Because almost every single woman, whether they express it with their mouths or they're thinking in their minds, undergoes such pain in the birthing process that almost all of, the, all of them, whether they say it with their mouth or they think it, they say to themselves, I'm never doing this again. Hell no. I'm not going to bring any more kids to this world. And that in and of itself necessitates that they need to bring a sin offering. Because they said something like that, obviously we know that one of the first commandments in the Torah is pru or vu, to, to give forth offspring. So because they say that, they, they, have to, they have to bring a sin offering for even thinking. Okay, moving a little deep, let's try and get to the sod, the secret, the, the deeper Kabbalah of why a woman becomes impure though. Why does she become impure when she just partook of one of the most beautiful acts in creation, bringing a new life into this world? And for this, we're going to we're going to turn to um, the Or HaChaim. Or HaChaim HaKadosh, uh, Rabbi Chaim Ibn Atar, was uh, a great Kabbalist, um, world-renowned. Died. It's brought from the Baal Shem Tov that had the Baal Shem Tov and Or HaChaim met. It would have been Geula, redemption of Messiah, just like that. He was, they, somehow the, the fusion of these two insane souls could have done such a thing. And the Or HaChaim has a, a whole commentary on the Torah, and it's really, really deep stuff. So what does he say? He says, we need to understand what impurity means. We, more, a lot of us, we hear the word impurity, and we just think, oh, it's a bad thing. Like, oh, she's, she, when a woman goes through menstruation, like she's impure, like she's dirty. And, and that's actually a very sad, lowly way of looking at it, according to the Or HaChaim's understanding. So we have, to, we have to look at what it means. And he kind of gives, us, gives it to us by means of like a parable. So he says, just like, um, just like you, let's say you have a vessel that is filled with honey. And now you use up all the honey. But there's still the residue of honey in the vessel, right? So what happens is all the insects flock to the empty vessel because of a great desire they have for the sweetness that's still stuck on all the sides of the vessel. So he says, so too the soul of a person is such a treasure. And when a soul departs from the body, the body contracts impurity because of the precious merchandise that is left. So we get a sense that like death, death is a type of impurity in Judaism, right? Someone who makes contact with the death had to be purified through the, the red heifer and the whole ritual of the red heifer. And they couldn't, you know, do a lot of things while they were in this impure state. So it's why? Because... The soul is such a lofty goodness. It's like the honey. And when the soul leaves, it's like the honey being all eaten up. But that vacancy, that void that's left, still there's like a sense of a residue of something very precious, very special was here. And right away, just like the insects flock to the, the, that empty vessel, so too it's like impurity comes there. Why? Because specifically something super lofty was here. Not because this is something very lowly, but something very, very lofty, actually. So purity means, what does purity mean? It means to be close to the creator. It means life. The greater the closeness, the greater the void that is left when something departs from it. So the Talmud says that three things are in the hands of God alone. Who will be a leader, a king, who will reign? Uh, the gift of bearing a child, that's a key that's in the hand of the creator alone. No one else really has that kind of power. And the resurrection of the dead. So what, you can see how these are all very big, powerful things, very lofty things. So a woman becomes impure because she has just taken a part in one of the most awesome experiences in creation that brought her so incredibly close to the divine that the void that follows maintains and leaves a residue of the lofty experience. So that's kind of the idea here of, of why, of impurity, that it can, it's not just impurity like a very uh, simple, you know, understanding. It's actually a very deep understanding. This was actually something very great, very lofty that, that, that has occurred. So it also kind of explains why if you look in this week's portion, there's a different impurity uh, period 
that the woman is in, whether she gives birth to a male child or a female child, longer for the female child, because there's this idea in Judaism that women are in a, and, and females are in a higher level of spirituality. So there's a longer period of impurity because she gave birth to a, a, a female offspring, a, a newborn girl. So that we, we use just to touch on that idea. Now let's move back to the idea of Cyrus. The Cyrus, we could say is, it seems like a curse, right? When, some, when there's a pandemic, when there's really, really bad things, when someone's really, really afflicted, it seems like, oh, I've been cursed. Here, um, there's actually a beautiful idea brought by the Kiddush, Kiddusha Tzion. So he says, uh, the verse that's brought in this week's portion is the homeowner comes and tells the Kohen. The Kohen was like the doctor at the time. The Kohen, you couldn't, even if you were, I heard, um, you know, Rabbi Moshe Weinberger actually say this the other day, but he said, even if you have the Gadol Hador, the greatest halachic Jewish uh, legal mind of the, the time, Rabbi Chaim Kanievsky, even if he looks at, were, were to look at his walls or his clothing and he would see Tsaras and this type of leprosy, and he knows Jewish law better than anyone, even if he were to look at it and see it, he wouldn't have the right and the ability to diagnose the situation. He would have to call a Cohen to come and do that. So we see that there's already something, you know, supernatural there. There's something, you know, kind of uh, beyond our understanding in a sense there. Um, and so the homeowner comes and tells the Cohen, and he says, and this is a word, something like a plague has happened to me in the house. Okay. So the, the question that the Kedusha Sion asks is why something like a plague, right? Why not say, hey, I see a plague. You know, why something like a plague? It seems very ambiguous. So he answers, because in truth, it's not a plague. Something, it's actually something very positive. Rashi tells us that when Cyrus stricken walls, were demolished, buried treasures were actually uncovered. You see, the Amorites, there was a Canaanite nations that preceded the Jewish people in this land. And after, you know, the, the, the Jewish conquest of this land, based on the decree by God that we should come into the land in the time of Joshua and take the land, and we did do so, you could imagine there were buildings there, and we took you know, and we moved into those buildings. Now you can imagine someone's super excited. They just moved to a new a country and they bought a beautiful home. And now all of a sudden they realize that behind, uh, you know, the, the wall, uh, the wall uh, papers or whatever, that, that all of a sudden there's a terrible affliction. There's like a mold of some sort or whatever. That, that would be really depressing. So this is what happens to the Jews. They, they finally come through all these wars and they take this and they finally have their home and you think, oh, I can finally sit in peace in my own home. And all of a sudden they discover that there's tsaras. There's this affliction. And what would happen is that they would, you know, call the Kohen, the priest, and he would come and he would look and he says, indeed, that's the situation. You have tsaras. And what would they have to do? Obviously, they would have to break down the walls. They would have to start over. What did they found? They found treasures that were hidden by the Amorites and the Canaanites from the conquest in the walls behind them. So what seemed to be a curse actually turned out to be a blessing in disguise, right? So why the question that the Kedush Tzion asks is why could God not allow the Jews to discover treasures in a positive way without contracting this kind of tsaris, this affliction? And he answers, rather, God wishes to demonstrate that events that appear negative are a means of facilitating great goodness. Our exile that we're in and all the exiles we've been in seem like terrible plagues. But in truth, it is only something like a plague. We can't see it with our own eyes. Its appearance is evil because we're limited mortals. The greater goodness will be revealed in the era of redemption when our own eyes will see that the exile was simply a road to the greatest possible goodness. Isn't that something, right? So uh, that's gen generally the case. This idea that, that, that what 
we look at in our own estimation, whether it's our own lives or his history, as major negatives. We've spoken about it many times, but actually our lofty, lofty goodness is something that we won't be able to tell until Mashiach. Messiah, as we've noted, has the same letters as Simcha. Simcha means joy. It's something that goes beyond all boundaries. When, when we do our blessings after a meal, we, we say, then our mouths will be filled with joy. And the idea of joy, laughter, happiness, is when something seems one way, and then all of a sudden, it just ca- catches you totally off guard and something co- completely unexpected occurs. So too, the, the redemption is supposed to be something totally unexpected. So for example, you see a muscle guy walking. He's just massive. He's just so strong. He's got muscles on his muscles. Six foot 27, like he's just giant, right? And all of a sudden, he slips into a tiny banana, banana peel. So you, why is that funny? And the reason it's funny is because it was so unexpected. Something so massive falling to something so pathetically small, an, an inanimate object, a little banana peel, right? So, so this is exactly what we're going to kind of sense in the redemption. We're going to, it's going to throw us for a loop. We're going to say everything seemed one way. Everything seemed so bad. Everything seemed so negative. We had pogroms and we had a holocaust and we had pandemics. And somehow a curveball is going to be thrown and we're, and we're going to realize that Oh my gosh, that was totally unexpected. And that's what's going to bring back our laughter. So there's a verse from this, the prophet that says, with joy you'll go out. The idea of joy is, again, this idea of something unexpected, something completely unseen, a curveball that was thrown. So let's, let's do you know, another idea. We're going to stay kind of, I think, with uh, this messianic type theme as we conclude with the last uh, 10 minutes of our lesson here. The Talmud says that the son of David, which is Messiah, right? Messiah is from the tribe of David, will only come when every government becomes heretical. And Rabba said, Rabba was, you know, one of the great uh, rabbis in the, uh, that mentioned in the Talmud throughout, where do we see an allusion to this in scripture from the verse uh, in this week's portion about the Mitzorah, someone who had contracted Cyrus? He has turned completely white. He is ritually pure. Just a little bit of context. That's from Sanhedrin 97a, by the way. So just to give us a little bit of context, what does that mean? Strangely, let's say you have someone who contracted Cyrus. This, again, type of leprosy. Leprosy, uh, not of today because it was a supernatural type of leprosy like we've spoken about that afflicted the walls and your clothes and whatever. Okay, so someone's gone. So let's say they've got like a mark here or wherever, right? Now, the, the, he goes into quarantine, which is, again, timely, right? Because most of us are in lockdown and quarantine. And he has to, you know, stay away from the population. He has to go outside the, the camp of the Israelites while he has the Cyrus. Why? Because he needs time to think about what he's done wrong. He's slandered and everything like that. And he needs to, you know, change his ways. Okay. Now, the, after a week, let's say, the, the priest comes back and sees it's spreading. It's not getting, it's not going away. It's spreading. So he says, sorry, you're still impure. You're still going to stay outside the camp. The Torah says something very strange. It says when the Cyrus, this mark, has grown so much that it's now, his entire body has gone white from this leprosy of the Cyrus. The, strangely enough, the Torah says he's now pure. It doesn't make sense, it seemingly, right? So this is kind of what we're saying here, that the, the Gemara says that David, the son of David, Messiah, will not come until they, every government has become heretical. When basically... Cyrus has afflicted every single government completely. And Rabba said, this is found in scripture based on this idea of the Mitzorah, the Cyrus that fools completely. So Rashi tells us, just as when the affliction is spread throughout the entire skin, the person is ritually pure, so too when all the governments have become heretical, the redemption will come. Crazy, right? Most of us are, I think, today, frustrated with our leaderships in whatever country we may be coming from. 
whether it's America or Israel or um, anywhere, uh, you know, North Korea, some places are easier than others, right? China, North Korea, whatever. But we, we, we're starting to get fed up with politicians. It's probably one of the reasons that Trump got elected because people in America were so fed up with these politicians that were just, you know, no good. You know, they, they shake hands and they put on a smile, but they really have hidden agendas and they don't actually, you know, there. So that's why they were like, let's completely change it up. We'll, we'll elect a business dude or whatever, a, you know, a movie star or a TV star. You, so, so we, we're seeing this. We're seeing this idea maybe that the, everything has become corrupt. But let's kind of un, understand it a little bit deeper. The Lubavitch Rebbe explains on this idea. And he says that this has two implications. One, that the world has become so corrupt that God is forced to take action on the demons. As we know, Messiah can come, uh, this is the statement that is given of the time of when Messiah will come. It can come in its time. The, the wording is, in its time, I will hasten. The idea is that there is a set time. And... If we're really good, then we can hasten it. But if not, it'll come in a set time. So the idea that, in a sense, we can we can make it come early. If we're really, really good, then it'll come early. In another place, the statement is that it will come either to an entirely righteous generation or an entirely wicked generation. So if we're very, very, very righteous, then the, the redemption can come very, very, very early in a very, very nice way. But if we aren't and we're all heretical and it's all wicked, then it'll come in its time and the generation will be seen like that. And the leadership is generally a reflection of, of the overall population. Okay. So that being said, he says the world has become so corrupt that God is forced to take action and redeem us. This is the, the worst case scenario in a sense. But the Rebbe being that he was always seeing things in a very positive light, says there's another implication, that the world has become so refined that it is easy to pinpoint corruption when it surfaces. So he's basically, in essence, saying that on the outside, it might seem that the, the, that the whole generation is so corrupt and so wicked and everything that you can clearly see that the, the government is so corrupt and wicked. But if you kind of change your perspective a bit, you could say that the world is so refined that it's so easy to see that there's something wrong. So you're able to see so clearly, oh, there's something wrong. Why? Because let's say you have a white sheet of paper and there's just one black dot. It's, it stands out. You can not notice it, right? So too, when, uh, the, unit, when the whole earth is on such a high level of, uh, of refinement, it's easy to notice that black spot, those areas that are just not right, there's something wrong with it. When people aren't behaving as they should, when governments aren't behaving as they should. So it's, it, it's worth mentioning as well the other well-known um, idea that's brought in the Gemara that the Messiah himself will be a Mitzvah. He is described in the Gemara as sitting at the entrance to the city the front gates, with all the other lepers and poverty-stricken individuals. But there's something unique about him. Where is the others have all these afflictions and therefore have bandages all over their bodies? And, you know, let's say once every few days or once a week, they take off all their bandages and then they put on all fresh bandages, as you would imagine. The Messiah is unique and different in, in that regard. He takes off one bad bandage, and then he puts on one clean one. Takes off another bad bandage, and he puts on another clean one. So the Gemara asked, what does this mean? Like, what's the significance of this behavior of his? And the answer that they, they bring is, that, first of all, one of the earliest places, the earliest place we see reference to the Messiah is in the very first, the beginning of the Torah itself. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the word was the darkness and void, and yada, yada, yada. And the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. And the sages ask, what is the Spirit of God that hovered over the, the, the divine presence, or, so to speak, that hovered over the waters? This is the Spirit of Messiah. That even before creation itself, Messiah, the soul, has always been waiting, 
to come in and, and do the job for it, which it was created to do. That he's been waiting that long, that soul has been waiting that long. Because at the end of the day, the whole purpose of creation is Messiah and redemption. And so the reason that Messiah's soul and Messiah himself is described as taking one bandage off and then putting a fresh one on is he's been since the beginning anticipating and waiting eagerly for the go-ahead, for the green light from God that he gets to redeem the world and, and fulfill the whole purpose of creation. And he doesn't want to delay even in the slightest. If he were to take off all his bandages and God would say, now is the time, go. He would have to waste another extra 10 minutes to put on all the bandages again and then go redeem. So instead, what does he do? Where does the rest of them do that? He takes off one and he puts on one. Let's say he takes off one now and God says, it's green light. Easy. Quickly put on one fresh one and he goes and he redeems them. So in a certain sense, we see afflictions. We see negative, these negative things as just that, as very bad things. When in truth, Messiah and that era, that whole period will reveal to us how they were actually the loftiest of goodnesses. They helped propel us to a higher level. You only grow when you're challenged. These times of negativity or of hardship brought out even a strength inside of us that we even didn't know we had. Can you imagine when you see these stories of what people had gone through, for example, God, you know, Lo Alena, but in the Holocaust and stuff, and yet people continue to, to be have faith and believe in God when they had, you know, every reason in the world to not believe in God, and yet they did. In the end, that negativity, that pain, that suffering ultimately brought out their incredible strength. And when we see in the end that there is no such thing, so to speak, as death, because we are infinite souls with infinite, um, you know, that because we come from the infinite himself, then all of a sudden, you know, death and, and, and suffering and everything kind of fades away. And we realize that all of this existence that we've been through has just been a test in order to prove and allow us to have merit, to receive what God wants to give us, but to receive it of our own accord, accord not as a free gift, but as something earned. This is a fundamental idea in Judaism, the idea of bread of shame, that we do not want God to just give us free handouts. We want to earn it. And the, all these tests and all the suffering and all these challenges have allowed us to do just that. So that is it for today's lesson. I hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you for tuning in. Questions? Anyone?